All right. I get the honor of uh, introducing our, uh, our guest speaker for this evening. Uh, it is no, no other than our San Antonio Mayor, uh, Ron Nirenberg. And I'm going to, uh, to read a bio. Very impressive, sir. Uh, Ron mm -hmm. Nirenberg is the mayor of San Antonio. Uh, one of the nation's fastest growing cities and, and with the seventh largest population in the United States. He was raised in Austin, Texas and attended college in San Antonio. Nuremberg is the son of an immigrant from Southeast Asia and the grandson of immigrants from Eastern Asia who passed through Ellis Island. Through his personal experiences, Mayor Nuremberg developed a core commitment to civic participation and the universal values of liberty justice and equal opportunity for every person. Mary Nirenberg was uh, reelected to the second term on June 8th, 2019. He was first elected to represent District 8 on the, on the San Antonio City Council in 2013. During his two terms, he championed smart city and regional planning, uh, inclusive economic development. And by the way, we're in our economic development month, uh, environmental stewardship, fiscal responsibility, and governmental accountability. As councilman, Nuremberg brought together a public-private coalition to save the world-renowned Bracken Bat Cave, the largest colony of bats in the world. Amazing. Under his leadership as mayor, the city's budget has been adopted with a focus on equity to ensure that all parts of the city have the same level of services uh, and infrastructure. He is focused on making key investments necessary to accommodate the growth of San Antonio, which is expected to nearly double in population by 2040. This forward-looking approach uh, drives the mayor's vision of a compassionate community with a global, uh, globally competitive economy. In 2018, the United States Conference of Mayors recognized Mayor Nirenberg with the Small Business Advocate Award for his efforts to encourage entrepreneurship. Uh, the mayor's policies priorities include nurturing the an educated uh, workforce in San Antonio through the Alamo Promise tuition free college uh, program and champion innovative transportation solutions through the city's first comprehensive multimodal transportation plan. In August of 2017, Mayor Nuremberg created the mayor's housing policy task force because all San Antonians, regardless of income level, deserve an opportunity. To find, a, to find quality, affordable housing within city limits. In an, in an effort to combat the effects of global climate change, Mayor Nuremberg spearheaded a climate action committee and adapt, an adaptation plan, which was adopted by the city council in October, 2019. Shortly thereafter, Mayor Nuremberg joined the climate mayor steering committee. This is, this is a group of 24 mayors who serve as the leading voice. Who are we there quiet for? How about that? Gonna mute everybody real quick. All right, uh, let's see here. Uh, all right, so uh, this is a group of uh, 24 mayors who will serve as a leading voice in efforts to uh, uh, further climate action in more than 400 cities across the US making up the Climate Mayors Coalition. Mayor Nuremberg is the chairman of Sister Cities International, a nonpartisan organization that connects cities across the globe through civic, educational, and cultural exchanges. The city of San Antonio enjoys active and produ productive sister city relationships with 11 cities worldwide. And Mayor Nuremberg has been an active participant in establishing productive people-to-people -people relationships, which is so important, through global community partnerships and volunteer action. Prior to his public service, Nuremberg was the founder of two small businesses, you know my pain, uh, worked as uh, the general manager for KRTU-FM San Antonio, and as a program director for the Annenberg Public Policy Center, where he developed and directed award-winning civic engagement programs. Nirenberg, Nir, Mayor Nirenberg graduated summa cum laude from Trinity University and received a master's degree in communication, math cum laude, from the University of Pennsylvania. He and his wife, First Lady Erica Prosper, and are the proud parents of Jonah. Uh, without further ado, I get to introduce uh, not only Mayor Nirenberg, but also fellow Rotarian, Mayor Ron Nirenberg. Mayor, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Xavier, for the introduction. Um, and fellow Rotarians, thank you very much for having me uh, this evening. It's great to be with you. I see so many familiar faces I haven't gotten to speak with in 
quite a long time. Jerry, it's good to see your face. Um, it's wonderful to be with you. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to talk for a bit, but I do have something special I want to share with you. Uh, so let me just kind of get into it and have a conversation because I'd love to take some questions as well. Uh, I think we're all kind of in the same uh, state of mind at this point with regard to what happened in 2020, um, a year that began with uh, tremendous promise and perhaps with expectations uh, that certainly weren't met. Uh, 2020 began uh, a period of, of San Antonio's uh, momentum that we hadn't seen in, in a generation. In fact, uh, we were about 3% unemployment. We were seeing kind of uh, our small business growth in the community, uh, experiencing some of the greatest momentum we've had in a very, very long time. And I can remember uh, when I got the call uh, that we were getting a plane load of passengers uh, from Wuhan, China, that were going to be flown into Joint Base San Antonio because the uh, federal government, Defense Department, DHS, and others had determined that the best way to repatriate Americans who were stuck in the middle of uh, China in this um, uh, growing outbreak was to bring them to uh, our military installations that were equipped to handle it. About four bases worldwide, or excuse me, four bases in the nation. Uh, one here in San Antonio, Texas, Joint Base San Antonio, which is uh, probably the best and most important in the country. And um, at that moment, we knew things were going to be a little bit different. In fact, I was on a plane actually to DC at the time. And uh, so we organized a meeting with some of our representatives in Congress to kind of give us a briefing of what's going on. And at that point, it was pretty simple. We were going to have a, a, you know, a couple hundred Americans uh, come back to be quarantined on base away from the general population. And, and hopefully it would, uh, you know, kind of extend from there. We'd probably bring in a few more folks, um, but they would be held and make sure that they're okay. And then eventually we'll return to normal. Well, things changed a bit when we found out that we were going to also receive some evacuees from a cruise ship, uh, the Diamond Princess. And uh, we, step, we stepped up with our health department and STRAC, which is the regional hospital operations, emergency operations that we conduct for the region, including eight states. We stepped up our protocol and I started calling uh, daily briefings uh, to ensure that we were on top of the situation. And it was at that meeting where, where we learned it was going to be a little bit different. The uh, contagiousness um, of the, and the, the danger of this virus was starting to become known. And so it was very important for us to make sure that there was proper protocols in place to make sure that these evacuees stayed on base, didn't get outside of the base until we knew that they were uh, healthy and that they wouldn't be uh, a danger to themselves or to others as they were released from quarantine. Uh, all that was going great. In fact, we have the best Defense Department personnel in the nation right here in San Antonio. We should be grateful for that. And there's a great partnership on and off base with the health, uh, health folks in the hospital systems. Everything was going great. Met with a lot of CDC personnel on the ground. Uh, and then I remember walking through the grocery store um, on a Sunday morning. I think it was February 28th and, or, or March 1st, somewhere in there, beginning of March. And I got a call from one of my staff members who said that uh, the CDC had mistakenly released a patient in quarantine who was still awaiting a test result. They had previously tested negative, but they were waiting for the second result to make sure that they were uh, you know, clear from the virus. Uh, actually, a third test result at that point. And it was still pending. And the problem was when it was coming back, they released them um, and they went to the mall, they went to a hotel, uh, but when they, hours later, the test result came back and it was positive. I got this call from my staff member and, and I nearly dropped my phone because I knew what that meant. Uh, luckily, they were able to retrieve the person, but you know what happened after that. We had to close down the mall, we had to, you know, ensure everything was disinfected. We have to contact trace every person that they may have come in contact with. Um, that was the moment things changed with regard to the coronavirus. Thank God nothing was spread from that incident. 
but we found out very quickly we're going to have to do things on our own because the federal government um, was changing the way they were dealing with the virus. And if we were going to protect our public, we had to be uh, we had to have two hands on the wheel at all times. Um, nothing happened from that incident, thank goodness. And in fact, there was a couple of weeks that happened after that that really nothing happened at all with the virus. But we knew because we had at that point got on heightened alert about this virus and the potential threat it would be. We knew at that point we had to be ready. It was just a moment of, it was just a, a, a point in time, sometime in the future, hopefully not soon, but sometime in the future, there was going to be a case that we would discover in the United States. And at that point, it was going to begin to spread. Thankfully, that experience with the CDC release got everybody's guard up uh, here locally. And about mid-March, uh, in fact, it was March 13th, where, uh, where we decided um, we, we're going to have to start uh, preemptively dealing with this virus. We had to uh, unfortunately postponed Fiesta. There was a major event going on downtown that we had to close off because at that point it was beginning to spread in the, in the West Coast and we had already discovered cases here in San Antonio. Well, you know how the rest of it went. Um, we, unfortunately, one of the most difficult decisions I've ever had to make was on March 18th, I had to make the decision to um, close restaurants and bars in San Antonio. Uh, because that was one of the major disease vectors that we were being told was a, a, a potential threat uh, to spread the infection. There's a lot we didn't know back then. There's a lot more we know now, but we had to preemptively, we had to get in front of this curve, in front of this pandemic that was beginning to spread in the United States. That was very difficult for me because I knew the costs of that in terms of jobs, in terms of revenue, because um, you know we have a small business community that thrives here in San Antonio, and one of them is the restaurant business. Um, well, that turned out to be an important decision uh, because you remember the cascading after that. The cases began to rise. We had to shut more things down. But thankfully, uh, the judge and I, Judge Wolf and I, have been in lockstep since the moment this began. And we made decisions together. And we saw, actually, uh, as the cases throughout the United States, particularly in New York and California, were beginning to go through the roof and entire communities were quarantined off from one another, we saw the cases start to come down. And we were very much in control of this virus. And we were getting, in some cases, in the middle of May, only a dozen or so cases a day, but they were going into the hospital, we were treating them, and it wasn't spreading. All that was going great. We had a great partnership with the state as well. Uh, Governor Abbott and I would talk very frequently. Uh, and then unfortunately, uh, things started to get a little haywire. And you started to see the federal government, the state government, and the local government begin to talk about this thing differently. And there was a rush to get back to normal. And at that point, uh, it became very political. And whereas the uh, local governments wanted to make sure that we were protecting public health by making sure the public health officials were were informing the decisions we were making, Texas began to open very rapidly in succession. And on top of that, we began to lose control of some of the uh, mandates that we have put in place, such as wearing of masks, which we were, which we were told uh, from our medical professionals was one of the simplest and most important ways we can prevent the spread of the virus. Um, all that happened um, in succession, which in my mind led to people feeling like the worst was over that we were out of the woods. And uh, you know how, what happened after that. In June, we began to see the numbers start to rise. In July, the numbers just exploded. And we had a very deadly July and August. Um, we began to get back on the same page with the governor. The governor put in some additional measures such as mask wearing and, and closed off some of the uh, places that were, were, uh, were, were creating a lot of congregation for infection spread. And we've been able to slowly, slowly, slowly get this thing back under control. And I'm happy to report that tonight, I just uh, went on the air with the judge, which we've been doing every single day. Uh, and, and in my mind, that was that being on the air every single day with the judge has been one way we can keep the attention focused on the importance of um, this uh, on, on our behavior and how we handle this virus to protect public health.
But just today I reported that we fell below 200 people in the hospital for the first time in about four months. It's taken that long to bring this, um, this infection back under control. We're in good shape. Uh, we're in containment, I would say. That's what our public health professionals call it. Uh, but we continue, we are going to continue to have to modify our behaviors in terms of physical distancing. You know, restaurants are open at 75%. You see the tables spread out. We're going to have to change the way we handle ourselves a little bit until there's actual uh, therapies and vaccines available widely for the community. Minor inconveniences in the grand scheme of things. We, we, we want to get businesses back open uh, as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, it's been difficult, I will tell you that. Uh, this is not uh, a, a situation that anyone wanted to have to deal with. Um, it's certainly not the, the year I envisioned as your mayor, uh, but it has been my goal to, to do a couple of things. One is uh, to ensure that we're working together with the community, uh, that the judge and I would have a partnership so that we're making decisions in coordination to protect our community, that all decisions that we make are going to be in consultation with those who are affected. And the most important thing, we have our public health professionals, the medical experts driving the bus uh, so that we make decisions in a non-political manner, that we do it on the basis of health because health is the foundation of our economy. So that's been going well. Um, it's been, it's been uh, a difficult process. We know how many thousands of people have become affected. We've lost over 1,300 of our family members and neighbors in this community, far too much of a toll. Uh, and, and we know what the story has been like across the country as well. But San Antonio has risen um, above many other communities. In fact, I would say most by virtue of that teamwork and that camaraderie. And I think that's what's gonna see us through the next phase. But let me rewind for a moment because uh, where this got real for us is the recognition that March um, and, the, and the coming health crisis would also lead to uh, what we see now, which is a very deep, challenging economic crisis for the entire country. The toll, human toll on this is only matched by the economic toll that it has taken across this country and really across the world. Um, and that was made very clear when in the days after the pandemic began, uh, a guy by the name of William Luther, who's a photographer for the Express News, uh, took some aerial photos of what was happening at the Traders Village Food Bank distribution site. And you know the photo I'm talking about. It's probably seared into your memories right now. It's a sea of cars that showed everyone lining up to get food to put on the table for their families. That was in the days after this pandemic began, back in, in April. What was so striking about that was not just the sea of humanity that was in that line and the, and the desperation that was in those pictures, but it was um, the recognition that that represented a doubling of the number of people who were in our food bank line before the pandemic began, 120,000 people per week, which meant that when this year started, and we had three and a half percent unemployment, actually less than that. We had the best economic momentum of our lifetime. When we had uh, businesses moving here, headquarters locating here, small businesses growing, we had 60,000 families living in San Antonio who had to depend on the food bank for food at 3% unemployment. Everybody had a job, but they had to depend on the food bank for food. It underscored the fact that even in San Antonio where we were rising and our economic momentum was real, that we had a, a, a crisis level of poverty on our hands, that we had in fact become uh, the top 25 metro, of all the top 25 metros, the one with the highest amount of poverty. That it was our city that best illustrated, that picture best illustrated the um, how close to the brink of economic devastation so many millions of Americans have been even before anybody had heard of the coronavirus. So that was the point, and I remember it very clearly. I was on a Zoom call just like this with the San Antonio Express News editorial board, and, and they asked me what kept me up at night. And I told them it was um, the rush to get back to normal. Um, the idea that normal was okay because what that showed me, that picture and, and what the stories that we've seen since then is that normal is not okay for us. Um, 
in that uh, we have to come back from this pandemic strong, but stronger and more resilient if we're gonna be a, a city uh, that can rise. And that families who are employed ought to be able to feed their families as well. So that's been our focus. And, and I wanna credit um, this entire room right now. And, and many people are in and I, I see Harvey on the screen. I had no idea he was part of this Rotary Club. Um, but people like Harvey and you all who have, have rallied, there's one thing that San Antonio has always leaned on and it's, and it's teamwork. And very quickly, uh, a friend of ours, all of ours, Gordon Hartman, myself and the judge got together and said, what, what do we have to do? Where do we go from here? And we decided, wipe the table clean. Every priority is gonna be different and we've gotta, we've gotta reassess what we do with our resources. And so we came up with several pillars. And with the Federal CARES Act money, the relief from the federal government, we've been able to pull all those resources together and focus on some very important things. Number one, make sure that nobody went hungry, that everybody had food on their table through this crisis. Number two, that as a result of this crisis, nobody lost the roof over their heads. Um, number three, that when it was safe to do, and we have to pave a path that's safe, when it was safe to do, that small businesses and businesses in general had the resources they had needed to get people back to work safely and get them back on their feet. Number four, that people had access to the internet because so much of our business, so much of our education system was gonna have to be virtual for some time and the digital divide uh, corresponded with that level of economic desperation. We had to bridge that digital divide. But most importantly, um, the, the, the most important pillar in my mind that we had to pay attention to, and one that I'm very grateful we have, uh, was to ensure that people could get back to work in an economy that has clearly changed. Um, one thing that we know about the San Antonio economy is that we have an extraordinary education attainment and skills gap. One in five San Antonio workers lacks a high school diploma. And of the 150,000 unemployment claimants in the wake of this pandemic, 68,000 of them were making $22,000 per year or less. Um, imagine that for a moment, trying to feed your family of five on $22,000 a year. What we know about this economic crisis is that there's been a tremendous amount of job loss and the jobs that have been lost are those at the lower end of the economic uh, spectrum. So not only are those folks who are working in lower wage income jobs um, out of work, their jobs are, are in many cases not going to be coming back. The Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that a quarter to a third of the jobs lost are never going to come back at all. And the jobs that are coming back are going to take not one year, three years, four years, five years, up to 10 years to come back. So the economy is changing. And what's really extraordinary and what gives us an opportunity to change the trajectory of the city and for our families forever is the fact that the same time those jobs are lost, we have thousands of job openings here in San Antonio for high wage careers that are left unfilled because we don't have a workforce that has the skills or the education to take them. So what we're doing now uh, in our focus, in addition to those other pillars such as food and shelter that I talked about, is we're ensuring that we can get people back on their feet. That's my focus right now. Let's get people back on their feet into gainful employment with family sustaining wages. And so we have a workforce recovery and resiliency program that's enrolling people right now that um, will train them for, you know, in some cases, two weeks to get a certificate for, to operate heavy equipment or in some cases a year to get a professional certificate for jobs that are available right now. They're aligned to industries with jobs available right now in higher wage in-demand careers. While they're training, they're gonna receive a stipend so that they can make ends meet. They can pay their rent, they can pay their mortgage, they can pay uh, to put food on their table so our economy can keep running and their families can keep living while they're getting trained. And at the end of that, they will flow into a job. But what's uh, what's, I think critical to know is that we are in an emergency, we're in a crisis, and the crisis is not gonna end at the end of the fiscal year. That program I just described goes from now until the end of this fiscal year. So what happens in October of 2021 when the crisis is still with us and we've still got people underemployed because you know the, the employment is starting to come back 
but they're still underemployed. So what do we do then? We, we recognize that every economist under the sun says well, we've got to sustain our efforts for an economic recovery for a longer period of time. So um, it pained me, but the work I was doing uh, at the beginning of the year to bring a multimodal modern transportation system to San Antonio would have to wait. We'd have to pause that for a minute and figure out a way to use those resources to get people back to work and get them back to work in family sustaining careers. So instead, we took that opportunity with the one eight cent sales tax initiative uh, that was coming available uh, to create a program that basically took the phase one of the workforce program I just described and extended it for another four years up to the end of 2025. And every year for the next four years, when that begins, we will take 10,000 people, 10,000 heads of household who are underemployed or unemployed, income displaced, get them onto the same kinds of job training tracks and in aligned in demand careers and be able to provide for them a a, a certificate, a credential, an education that allows them to get right into a job that's available right now here in San Antonio to allow our businesses to grow, but also families to be sustained. 10,000 families a year, heads of household getting out of the food bank or out of the food line and into gainful employment in which their kids and their families can thrive. So all told between now and 2026, the beginning of 2026, we will take 60, excuse me, 55,000 families uh, and put them on path to economic mobility. In my view, it will be one of the most profound things that we can do to change what has been the largest poor city in America, one that is struggling in the midst of an economic and health crisis, to become a city where everyone can thrive. Um, and that's why I've been focused on Proposition B, SA Ready to Work, um, you all do so much for our community. Um, I think part, my outlook on public service was shaped by the Rotary Club when I was very young. I went to the Hill Country in a, uh, a, during a camp, summer camp called Camp Enterprise, and they talked to me about how business is service and how to create a business. Uh, that was Rotary Club um, and how businesses can give back. I wanna thank people on this call because business public sector, industry, community has come together to create this opportunity for our, our, our families. And Proposition B, uh, which is the other end of the educational pipeline from Proposition A, which is the continuation of Pre-K for SA, an extraordinary and proven uh, program, uh, bookends our ability to create a workforce for the future that can sustain families and get us out of poverty. And I wanna thank, uh, you know, Camp, uh, Camp Enterprise and Rotary Club for giving me uh, some uh, outlook on how we can get that done. Um, and let me give you the, the greatest part about this. In the midst of a pandemic, um, with challenges on our resources uh, and, and uh, you know, obstacles that every city and community in the country has, uh, we are going to take the city with the highest amount of poverty and create a model program that I guarantee you will be modeled nationally um, and we're gonna do it without raising taxes. We're gonna do that without needing any additional resources. We're gonna do that by reassessing our priorities and answering the question that everyone is asking themselves nationwide, which is where do we go from here? And we're answering it with a, with a San Antonio answer, which is when we invest in our people, our people will thrive. Um, so I wanna um, say thank you to the Rotary Club. Um, uh, past and present, and certainly tonight, uh, for giving me some opportunity. Um, you do all. You all do so much. Um, I'm going to ask you to do a couple things. Number one, uh, continue to do what you're doing with the service programs that you have. Uh, I know your partnership with Casa for Halloween. It's wonderful. It gives people a little bit of hope during the holidays that are not going to be normal. Uh, I also appreciate uh, your work with Corazon Ministries and and. Um, you know, the jeans, blue jeans drive, quintessentially San Antonio, by the way. Uh, thank you for that. But also, please go vote on November 3rd. Um, forget, uh, you know, I won't talk about the top of the ballot, uh, partisan um, uh, ballot uh, stuff going on there. We all know it's an important election. But at the very end of this ballot, the very bottom of this ballot, 
are these three propositions. Proposition A, pre-K for SA, critically important. Proposition B, SA ready to work, extremely, extremely important. Please vote for that. Please vote for Proposition B. Please vote for Proposition A. And by the way, that great project that we were planning at the beginning of the year and uh, about making sure we have a modern transportation system for the future, it's also on the ballot, but it's, it's, it's modeled in a way that we won't have to raise taxes. They're gonna come in on the tail end of the workforce program and simply take over the revenue from there after we're done. So Proposition A and the ATD is that program. So I would ask for your support on all three of those initiatives. I think they're extremely important for, for our, our, um, our community and our future. And, and again, I wanna say thank you, um, but before I give up the floor, uh, Xavier, I'd like to say thank you by offering a proclamation, recognition of all the work that you do for, for so long across the world. So if I may read it, uh, the City of San Antonio Proclamation Proclamation, whereas Rotary International District 5840 will observe World Polio Day on October 24th, 2020, to raise awareness and celebrate its efforts to eradicate polio worldwide. And whereas polio or poliomyelitis is a paralyzing and potentially deadly infectious disease that most commonly affects children under the, under the age of five, and the virus spreads from person to person, typically through contaminated water, and whereas Rotary is a global network of 1.2 million neighbors, friends, leaders, and problem solvers who unite and take action to create lasting change in communities around the globe. And whereas Rotary has helped immunize more than 2.4 billion children in 122 countries and contributed more than $1.8 billion towards eradicating this disease worldwide. And whereas today, polio remains endemic only in Afghanistan, Nigeria, and Pakistan, but it's crucial to continue working to keep other countries polio free. Now, therefore, I, Ron Nuremberg, mayor of the city of San Antonio, in recognition thereof, do hereby proclaim October 24th, 2020, to be World Polio Day in San Antonio, Texas. Wow. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Xavier, so um, I yield to you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And thank you so much for the proclamation. I know all of our Rotarians on the call uh, are excited. Uh, this is, that's a great, uh, great deal for us. Uh, and also it, it leads into talk about COVID because uh, as polio is a very infectious disease, so is COVID. Uh, you touched on that uh, and you, you've hit on a lot of topics. Uh, first, I'll ask the first question and, and, and um, pivoting during this time, uh, you know, as, as leaders on this call, uh, uh, you know, we have club presidents on this call that each, each have their own body of Rotarians. Um, having to pivot when they had a vision for a year how i know you said it was tough but did you wake up one day and say okay i got it or did you did you have to wait a, a little bit to it for it to kick in and say okay now i have a game plan how did that process kind of work for you yeah um you know it, it it's hard to pinpoint one thing but there were certainly moments um and, and so I'll, I'll describe a couple of them um, the first moment I, I already talked about was the, the meeting I had with Gordon and the judge where, where we just said, we got to wipe it clean. And it was on the heels of the, um, that image that we saw of the food bank lines. That was, that was a, a moment in time that, that is terrible to, under, terrible to experience, but so critically important. And I think that moment will prove to be, in the long run, a very, very positive thing for San Antonio. Um, I also remember Eric, um, I've been, I was sitting right here and Eric walked in, Eric Walsh, our city manager, and, and it was after that conversation and he said, you know, um, that one eight cent sales tax, um, maybe we should take a look at that. And, um, and, and I said, you're right, you're right. Uh, to hear it verbalized uh, was a different thing. Um, I do remember I was sitting in this chair actually right here uh, for the state of the city address that we had to do virtually. Um, and, and, I, and I said, we're gonna have to pause um, Connect SA, the, the multimodal transportation plan initiative. My phone blew up when I said that because it, I, I really hadn't verbalized that at that point, but there's a lot of different moments. Um, but again, I would, I would credit um, teamwork for all that because everyone contributed to it. I, I would also uh, suggest we have the best models of teamwork with the San Antonio Spurs. Tim Duncan knows how to pivot. Uh, and we know how to pivot. 
and, and I think the importance of being able to pivot in a crisis can't be understated. There are some communities that were never able to do that um, and they're suffering because of it. But we've been flexible enough to, and humble enough, I believe, to um, you know, reassess our own priorities and expectations. And, and I think that that's, that's been very, very helpful. Personally, I think you've done a, a, an amazing job in leadership. And I think that the words that you stated this evening uh, transcend to all of our leaders in, in District 5840. Uh, pivoting and, and definitely adapting quickly is definitely the way to, uh, it's the way of the future, right? We don't know how many of these pandemics we're gonna get in the future. We don't know what crises we're gonna be met with, but pivoting is, is where it is. And, uh, and, and from your testimony this evening, uh, we're able to see that it works. Um, Mayor, we have a question from the audience, if you have a, a, a little bit of time. Uh, sure. From Randy and Denise Surratt. Now, th their question is, are there aspects of, or functions of city government that you're concerned about that have been overcome or marginalized by COVID and social unrest that will need significant attention after we work through the response of the most pressing issues? Yeah, and I, yes, absolutely. And it's a great question. Um, uh, so, number one, we all know resources have been stressed, so there's only so much that we can do with the resources that we have, and, and I want to give a nod to, to Harvey again because he helped lead a philanthropic effort that has helped fill in all the gaps for our community, uh, particularly with the food bank, by the way. Um, they, they have to, to work very hard to um, you know, keep their operation going. They, I, I would encourage everyone to go take a tour of the food bank with Eric Cooper one of these days and go volunteer to fill food boxes with him. Their operation is, in my opinion, one of the most miraculous logistical enterprises in the world. How fast they have to turn that food that comes in from all directions uh, and do it in a safe manner so often, it's really incredible. Um, but to answer the question directly, there has been social unrest. We, we didn't talk about the second crisis which is that of um, the racial injustice and the systemic injustice that has been um, exposed and magnified by uh, a number of um, in incidents across the country, um, not the least of which was the uh, murder of George Floyd. We felt that here because no one is immune to this. Um, and we have to address that. There is an undercurrent of disparity that on a number of levels, but I would say that where it, where it shows up most is in health outcomes. You know, health disparity, the mortality rate in the South Side with COVID-19 is so dramatically different than in other parts of town. Uh, and, it, and it tracks perfectly with income level, tracks perfectly with educational attainment, tracks perfectly with poverty. There is a, a level of disparity that we have to address. Um, so yes, that, that is part of it. In terms of city functions that I'm worried about, um, I'm worried about the arts, the arts and cultural community, frankly. Uh, it is, um, un it, it's not considered a core service. I don't know if uh, I would necessarily agree with that because I don't know if we would, uh, you know, it's been debunked, Winston Churchill never said this, but it's been attributed to Winston Churchill that um, someone said that during World War II, um, why are we, uh, funding the arts or something like that. Why are we wasting money in the arts when we need to be funding our military? And he said, well, then what are we fighting for? <laughs> um, that was the, the legend of the quote, I guess. But at any rate, the arts unfortunately have sustained significant damage uh, because of the loss of revenue and people can't go out and enjoy the arts right now or, or performances. I'm worried about that. We've got to find a more sustainable way of funding it uh, because right now it's almost entirely from purchases that you make, uh, activity in the economy. And to me, arts and the cultural community, it's unique to San Antonio. It has to continue. It has to be a fundamental aspect of how we grow this community. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, I'll touch on a few things there. You talked about uh, social unrest and equity uh, in, your, in your speech this evening. And I'll tell you that here in District 5840, after the killing of George Floyd and just some of the other things that were kind of highlighted, uh, the inequities, uh, especially in healthcare, uh, I took it upon uh, myself with a few great folks here in the district to say, what could we, how, how could we respond? And so I'm proud to say that we're working on building the world's first ever uh, Rotary Club of Equity and Justice. 
Uh, and we've already have, we've spoken with um, the San Antonio Area Foundation, and I'm also aware that there's an equity department here in the city. Uh, and we've already begun some of those conversations as well, uh, because we want to respond in the, the best way that Rotarians know how. We're here for humanity at large. And um, as you say, it happened in, in uh, Minnesota, but we felt it here. Uh, I felt it certainly as governor. I was trying to figure out, okay, you know, I not only do I have to focus on my year, but I have to focus on what I'm feeling as well. Uh, and so through the conversations and encouragement and things of that nature, uh, I believe it would be the first in the world and we're, it's gonna be eClub. So it's open to anyone in the nation or anyone in the world for that matter, because now we're having virtual meetings. So uh, if we could work with the city awesome. now and invite uh, folks uh, on board to help us with that endeavor, that would be great. And no, I was gonna ask you to, yeah. to yeah, keep me apprised in that because that, that is worth highlighting something that we can be proud of in San Antonio. I'd love to, love to help you with that. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. We definitely will. Um, I've got two more questions if that's okay with you. Uh, sure. So, okay, after the pandemic, uh, the world is going to be changed. Uh, when that time comes, uh, what will it take for San Antonio to become a major manufacturing shipping hub uh, in addition to our major industries? I love this question. It's almost teed up. <laughs> what do we have to do? Uh, we, ha we have to train our workforce, you know, because the jobs are actually already here and they're growing. Um, we have a, a new um, truck manufacturer here called Navistar that is going to be innovating the way we do heavy truck uh, production. They just announced uh, their first truck off the line. They're building their headquarters, excuse me, they're building their, um, their manufacturing facility right now. Uh, we know that uh, aerospace is going to come back. We've got major, major production, uh, both in defense as well as uh, uh, commercial civilian happening with Boeing and Lockheed and many others. Um, we know what Toyota has done. These uh, companies and these sectors have supply chains as well. And one of the things that San Antonio has done extraordinarily well, uh, and you know, credit many leaders before me, uh, Ivy, Julian, Phil, um, Mayor Cisneros way back then. Um, one thing they've been able to do is, is start to build clusters. And we are not landlocked. We have companies that wanna locate next to these big hubs and start to create opportunities for them not to have to ship parts across the world uh, and that's what's happening here in san antonio it's happening in an advanced manufacturing way because the nature of manufacturing has changed and it's it's no longer um wrench turning it's it's keyboard clicking so um it's requiring new skills we've got to make sure our our workers are educated and trained uh and that's to me what will allow us to be a, a world leader in manufacturing it's happening we just have to continue to, to supply the demand that's that's amazing. Uh, and I, we have a few call to actions, uh, fellow Rotarians, uh, and I wrote down quite a quite a few uh, this month. We're celebrating uh, our economic development and community development uh, is our theme this, this month. Uh, and so we have a few call to actions where we get involved with the local community to educate folks and give them vocational training of some sorts or bridge the gap uh, to help support what's happening in the city and what the community needs at large. Uh, and also uh, the arts. Uh, some of our Rotarians are asking in chat, you know, how can we support the arts? What is something that we can do? Is it donations? Is it, you know, what is that, sir? No. Yeah, well, um, so on, on the arts funds, uh, there's a number of different foundations. I, I would encourage you uh, to uh, find the arts organizations that you enjoy and become a member, uh, number one. Uh, provide, if you can, uh, additional donation. If you're interested in more of a kind of just a, a, um, a donation for the arts community in general, uh, the Area Foundation actually has funds specifically for that uh, and relief funds uh, as well. So um, there's a lot of different ways. There's also, excuse me, a, a program called Big Give every year uh, that, you know, takes uh, donations and then distributes it to virtually every nonprofit in San Antonio. So there's a number of ways uh, for you to get involved and, and to provide support. Uh, what was the first part of that, Xavier? I'm sorry, before the arts? Uh, before the arts, well, we we're just talking about call to actions and how we can get involved and, and offer vocational training uh, to support the community. And I, and I think our Rotarians know what to do on that aspect of things. They're already in that, 
uh, doing that, that great work. Uh, but, you know, Mayor, I just want to, again, thank you again for, for joining us uh, this evening and, and telling us all the great things that the city has going on and how you've personally pivoted uh, and how teamwork makes the dream work uh, and how we're charting the path towards a positive uh, standpoint. And so I, I'm proud uh, to say now, now I'm a Georgia boy, but I'm proud to say that I'm a San Antonio, San Antonian as well. And again, thank you for the proclamation. Uh, October 24th, again, is World Polio Day here in San Antonio. Um, and sir, right before you leave, uh, one of our Rotarians, Don, he has something to say to you. Don, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Ron, I want to tell you that I have listened intently at, for everything you've said. And as your former professor, I'm awfully proud of you. I just have one question. How in the heck did your hair get so gray? Um, you don't I'll have to answer. You lost yours, Don. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Probably the wow. same way. <laughs> I didn't see you on the screen. I still don't. But um, uh, let me just say publicly that Professor Van Endy um, was the best teacher I ever had. And I'm not kidding you. It's not because you're here, Don. It's very true. I know many of my classmates feel the same way. So. Great to see you, Don. Thank you. That is awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, all of Rotarians, thank you so much for being here. We did record this session, so you'll find it on the district website. Uh, Mayor, I know you're tired. You, you've been up all day uh, taking care of business. But again, thank you. Uh, and feel free to drop off whenever you need to, sir. Uh, again. Have uh, a wonderful night, y'all. Thank you. You too. Uh, again, to Rotarians, thank you so much again for joining. We will have this up uh, on the district website. Please share it out to any Rotarians that, uh, that may have missed it. But we have a lot of great things going on within District 5840. I encourage you to invite a friend. Uh, this is an opportunity to open it up to the world. Uh, and also with hybrid meetings, your friends that live out of state, they can now join District 5840. So keep an open mind, remember to pivot, uh, and uh, overall have fun. I look forward to getting out and serving with you guys and also doing some service projects. Please send it our way, and we will be out there with our N95 masks and our social distancing. Uh, if there are no, any other questions, going once, going twice. Thank you all again. Have a good evening. Good job, Xavier. Bye.